Well, I think we will move now from politics, economics, um, and many other um, areas that we have been um, addressing here today to um, literature and, do I have to use a microphone? Oh. oh, okay. So, um, to the field of American literature and education, because I'm going to make a few allusions to uh, what's going on in terms of education in the United States. Um, well, first, I would like to thank the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy and the organizers of the 2014 Madrid Symposium on Peace Building and Conflict Resolution for inviting me to participate as a keynote speaker. I feel very grateful and honored to contribute for my experience as a professor of American literature at the Universidad Autónoma of Madrid in the dialogues of this meeting and in the active support of peace and conflict resolution. When I received Mr. Dumfries' request, my first thought was leading the audience into my philosophy, objectives, and results as a higher educator in the, films, in the field of the humanities who deeply believes in the power of education as an active process of social transformation and development. Moreover, I'm convinced that literature, and American literature in particular, allows us to generate multiple constructive channels of communication through which we can discuss and resolve a wide variety of social conflicts related to our identity, ethnicity, race, gender, sexuality, and political ideologies. But perhaps the most important aspect of teaching American literature is the opportunity it proposes to generate more understanding, dialogue, and trust between cultures. Throughout my experience as an educator, I have tested these fundamental issues in my classes where students have always acknowledged that one of the aspects they have most enjoyed in their experience as active readers was that I had given them the opportunity to develop their own voices. To me, that is the most rewarding response I might have ever received as a professional in education. And this is precisely one of my goals in the educative process I want to approach in this talk. However, I would like to begin with a short overview of what are the uh, ideological background and the principles that sustain my educational approach. Firstly, let me think, uh, no, this is, ah, uh, yes. Firstly, most of us believe that the best way to motivate ourselves and our students is by using external rewards like money or social success. But according to Daniel Peck's book, Drive, the surprising truth about what motivates us, published in 2011, the secret to high performance and satisfaction at work, at school, and at home is a deeply human need to direct our own lives, to learn and create new things, and to do better by ourselves and our world. Peck also notes that, quote, developing young people's capacities for imagination, creativity, and empathy will be increasingly important for maintaining the nation's competitive advantage in the future, end of quote. I truly believe in Peck's vision, and I try to apply his philosophy to higher education. His words are full of common sense, humanistic understanding, and transcendental vision about the challenges of the future. But what is more important, they rely on basic ideas of human knowledge and personal development, such as autonomy, mastery, and purpose. These fundamental ideas are basic for innovation and personal success in contemporary society, and to me, this is a key to achievement in education. Secondly, I would like to speak briefly about the changes that are currently going on and promoted in the American educational system. In this respect, I would like to mention here Professor Tony Wagner, one of the members of the Change Leadership Group at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. By the way, Professor Tony Wagner was um, uh, chosen by President Obama to lead these uh, important uh, changes in education in America. I had the pleasure of meeting him in June 2012 at the International Symposium on Education and Technology at Harvard University. From my perspective and as educators, the most relevant aspects that should be promoted in our different fields of knowledge should be questioning, thinking, and creativity. 
In this sense, Professor Wagner believes that today's students need to master seven survival skills to thrive in the new world of work, of work. and I have uh, included them on, on, on my presentation. The first one is critical thinking and problem solving. The second one, uh, second one is collaboration and leadership, agility and adaptability, initiative and entrepreneurialism, effective oral and written communication, accessing and analyze, analyzing information, and finally, curiosity and imagination. Well, I think that not only our students should be able to succeed in these compelling skills. In my view, we should all apply this heptalogue to enhance our performance in our different professional fields. And above all, I'm sure that we'll always find places where all these skills will be valued. Thirdly, in the highly technological, competitive, and consumerist world that we are all living in and try to survive, it seems that according to some politicians, our main goal as university professors is to teach skills so that our students are prepared to accommodate to what the employers demand. And that is why we should exclusively think about in terms of what we do in our classes. Nevertheless, I have a divergent attitude in this sense because universities should be able to educate our students for their future life and for work as well. In this slide, I intend to use a multidisciplinary approach that seeks a double end. On the one hand, the deep knowledge of American literature from a formal, aesthetic, historical, and social perspectives, and on the other hand, the use of texts to discuss about today's social conflicts and concerns regarding race, gender, ethnicity, women's rights, social minorities, and so on and so forth. Rutgers professor William Dowling, in a letter to the Chronicle of Higher Education in 2004, noted that reading Chaucer or Shakespeare is immensely more important to one's inward development than, quote, giving employers the skills they demand or they want. I agree completely with Dr. Dowling's thinking because I'm convinced that reading makes students not only wiser, but more transcendentally. Uh, it awakens their critical awareness. Furthermore, we should promote the highest goals among our students so that they are motivated to achieve individual autonomy and a mind that is able to discriminate among the unfathomable sea of information we all process every day. So my aim is to educate them for work and for life. And with this grounding viewpoint in mind, I develop my approach to the object of study, which is American literature. American literature and history are invaluable sources of inspiration for today's students as it teaches, among other things, different versions of the American dream. That is, that in its purest form is a vision of a society that permits individuals to develop their potential without reference to their background or origins. The historian Jennifer Hotchild identifies four tenets of the American dream in her book, Facing Up to the American Dream. First, that everyone may participate equally in society. Second, that everyone may have a reasonable anticipation of success. Third, that success comes from one's own efforts. And fourth, that failure is a result of lack of talent or will. In this light, American literature has established a tradition in promoting individuals need to identify and trust one's own feelings and intuitions through an exploratory and heuristic methodology that was developed during the revolutionary period, the Enlightenment, and the American Renaissance. One of the most uh, famous American intellectuals, um, in this sense, Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who delivered his influential speech, the American scholar, in 1837 at Harvard University, where he claimed that the students should be independent from the, uh, from the thoughts of others and should develop a creative reading and writing. This idea was echoed by many of Emerson's contemporaries and by later writers, including Henry David Thoreau, who was his disciple, and Henry David Thoreau was um, the author of Walden and Civil Disobedience, which inspired Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi in their um, passive resistance um, philosophy. This groundbreaking approach to knowledge and life helped my students to get acquainted with the basic premises of autonomy and critical thinking. When my students read this essay, they are not very familiar with the rhetorical construction of this 19th century text. 
not even with most of the network of intertextual allusions which appear in this essay. However, my objective with this seminal text is to explain how these sources reinforce the author's argumentation, the main purpose being to reflect about the importance of developing one's independence and individual creativity as human beings. In other words, I try to motivate my students to build up critical thinking and to question every aspect of the learning process. The second part of my talk today um, is entitled Looking at Oneself Through Others' Eyes. I call this part um, uh, of my talk in this way because it is another way of expressing the transcultural dialogue I mentioned before. Reverend Martin Luther King said once that man must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. I no doubt endorse King's wise words, but I would like to add that apart from love, a deep knowledge of the struggle between opposing interests is an essential aspect in the process of conflict resolution. In other words, we should explore in depth the origins, development, and peculiarities of that particular human conflict in order to find the path to solve it. Let me give you a specific example that involves one of my main fields of research, which is women's studies or gender studies as well. Feminist researchers argue that because knowledge is socially constructed and thus dependent on given social, cultural, and historical contexts, the explanation of women's knowledge will itself involve perspectives in conflict. In the specific case of women's social experience, they are socialized to manage and internalize conflict as part of the acquisition of femininity, and we all know about it. So women's experience of conflict, for example, in the domestic or working spheres is often pathologized. One of the texts that dramatizes this conflict is precisely Charlotte Perkins Gilman's short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, published in 1892. This claustrophobic text explores the social violence against women in all its cerebral dimensions. Gilman portrays a woman who, do, who goes mad because her husband, who is her doctor and society as a whole, insists that the cure for the, her postpartum nervous depression is a total suppression of her creative individuality. Mm, in fact, she has no way of writing or painting or reading. So the nameless protagonist uh, is secluded in a haunted colonial mansion in the middle of the wilderness where she's forced to leave uh, supposed to follow a therapy based on the absolute prohibition of any intellectual work. Even though she finds a great emotional relief in writing and reading for her emergent hysteria. The story clearly dramatizes how women's experience of the body is pathologized. In the process of writing a secret diary, which is the text we read, the protagonist makes efforts to overcome her isolation and depression. Even though she finds the yellow wallpaper of her room prison disgusting and sickening, no one at home will do anything to change these circumstances. Little by little, the yellow wallpaper becomes a symbolic mirror of her anxiety and her desires to abandon this prison. The story has an open ending, as all literary masterpieces, in which we find the first person narrator fantasizing about being free in herself from this prison. These are the final, this is the final paragraph of the story. I've got out at last, I said I, in spite of you and Jane, and I have pulled off most of the papers so can't put me back. Now, why should that man have fainted? But he did, and right across my path by the wall, so that I had to creep over him every time. Well, the ending is very open. Uh, it suggests many interpretations. I won't get in, in these interpretations, but, I think that this short story is a central text to speaking about women's body, women's creativity, madness, and the terrible effects of patriarchy. The students immediately identify the origins of the conflict of the protagonist's experience and how to solve it through the recognition of a social problem that involves women and men as well. Throughout the discussion of the story, the students are exposed to the devastating effects of a patriarchal society's crippling limitations which drive a female protagonist into madness. Among many other things, Gilman's literature attempts to restore an equal gender balance, to emancipate women, and to promote the best development of society. 
Even though she was a turn of the century author, her literature and her, the story she depicts are valuable in the classroom to approach social conflicts, such as gender discrimination. Another short story that approaches brilliantly the evils of racism is Kate Chopin's The Cires Baby, published in 1893, in which the author depicts a terrible story of miscegenation using her bilingual, bicultural background and the local color and geography of the state of Louisiana in the United States. The story goes as follows. The Cire Valmonde, who is the epitome of beauty and motherhood in Victorian terms, find that the son she has born for her cruel slave-holding husband, Armando Bigny, is a mulatto. When she beseeches Armand to explain how this can be so, he accuses her of not being white. They are both expelled from the plantation when he discovers that his wife is not white and his son is of mixed blood. Crushed by Armand's rejection, Desiree disappears with her infant into the bayou. Hmm? Nobody knows what happens with her and her baby. Only later does Armand discover in a letter written by his mother to his father that he himself, quote, belongs to the race that is cursed with the brand of slavery. Aubigny's fear of miscegenation is also related to the offspring on interracial relationships with a mulatto or half-breed considered as a monstrosity or a freak of nature. The story clearly, uh, approaches the turn of the century American society, uh, which was becoming multiracial and hybrid, but still the mixed race body was envisioned as the other, the monster of the Gothic home. Desiree's home hides many secrets, violence, cruelty, racism, rape, miscegenation, powerlessness, vulnerability, the brutality of slavery and racism, because Armando Bigny rules the plantation with cruelty. But the Cire is happy because she has given him an inheritor, his only son. Even though she's powerless and dependent as an, an aspect of her existence which is implicit in her name, her life depends upon being desired. Thus, her life begins and ends with the antithesis of desire, which is abandonment, since she is adopted. Unfortunately, the Cire life depends on the whims, social class, and race of her husband. The final turn of the screw of the story <clears throat> is an act of poetic justice which over, of, overtly indicts Armando Bigny's ideology and cruelty, which is based on white supremacy. The ending of the story is an ironic commentary on the results of, this, of his attitude because he ends up with his family and with himself as he becomes the only one whose racial origins are not so clear. In other words, Chopin makes a clear commentary about the futility of racism because one can never know or be sure about one's racial origins. In spite of the attempts to restrict intermingling, miscegenation was common, although it remained a largely taboo subject. Aubigny's attitude reveals the hypocrisy of whites in their claims to racial superiority and nullifies the belief that there were essential differences between races. Nevertheless, the surprise ending amplifies with great effort, with great force, the theme that pervades the whole text, the horror of mixed blood or miscegenation. This remarkable story is one of the most compelling my students have ever read about racism, racial prejudices, and miscegenation. Once the students have perused the text, a very significant debate emerges about the origins and ideological grounds of racism, the relevance of miscegenation in our society, and how the text opens up a transcultural dialogue about a conflict which is a relevant issue in our contemporary societies, becoming more and more ethnically diverse as part of the migratory processes. The conclusions this story poses are really surprising in the sense that some of my students speak out about their own social background, their friends, their neighbors and relatives, and how they sometimes detect racial prejudices among them. So this text is an effective tool to make them aware about how racial prejudices are part of their own world and how they can in some way change and challenge those intolerant and violent ideologies. The last example among the many I could bring here is um, Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl, published in San Francisco in 1956. This revolutionary poem was the symbol of the Beat Generation movement, 
Well, the Beat Generation movement was a cultural movement, a generation of individuals who fought against uh, uh, the consumerism, the different wars that were, uh, were going on in America, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. And so they represented a kind of um, movement which was rebellious and uh, resisted you know, certain American policies of the 50s. This poem was written during the Cold War period in the United States, an age which was characterized by intolerance, repression, consumerism, and materialism, as I mentioned before. The poem becomes a sort of poetic manifesto that engages in contemporary political and social issues. Ginsburg's prophetic voice allows a uh, follows the tradition of Walt Whitman's Song of Myself and condemns conservatism and aggression of the Cold War America. It is dedicated to Carl Solomon, whom, uh, whom Ginsburg met during his stay in the mental ward of a hospital. The first lines begin with a forceful statement. I want to read it. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked. Madness is one of the most significant themes of the poem, but in this case, Ginsburg, as well as many other writers of the period, gives it a different significance as it, as it becomes the symbol of mental clarity, truth, and resistance. The lyrical voice satirizes the psychiatric treatments administered to his lover, Carl Solomon, and to his Jewish mother, the brilliant Naomi Levi, as well. Some of the dangerous treatments used by American mental hospitals of the 50s and the 60s to change certain unacceptable behaviors were electroshocks and lobotomies, which were so aggressive that they could even cause severe lifelong brain damage. Similarly, Howell lamented the 1950s wastes. Good minds buried under layers of convention, stifling restrictions on art and sexual repression. I'm going to quote from the, the poem. And who were given instead the concrete void of insulin, metrosol, electricity, hydrotherapy, psychotherapy, occupational therapy, ping pong, and amnesia. Ginsburg stated that with this controversial poem, he wanted, quote, to leave behind after my generation an emotional time bomb that would continue exploding in the US consciousness in case of our military industrial nationalist complex solidifying into a repressive police bureaucracy, end of quote. In spite of the scandal and the obscenity trial the poem went through in California, Ginsburg never expatriated himself from American society and culture. On the contrary, he became an activist for free speech and gay rights. He supported the Vietnam War protests. He opposed to treatments for madness, militarism, sexual repression, economic materialism, and consumerism. The reading and discussion of this thought-provoking poem has many implications for the students. It is amazing how they can get involved with Ginsburg's poem, even though they always have prejudices against poetry because they consider it a very abstruse and complex literary genre. They attempt to make presentations in which they identify with the right of the individuals to resist, dissent, and do it in a creative way. They fight Ginsburg poem, a political tool which not only represents a very specific moment of American social history, but it also transcends the cultural barriers and establishes an intercultural social dialogue. There are many other examples I could mention here about my teaching approach and the different contexts of transcultural dialogues, but I should conclude here. However, I would like to thank my college students for their enthusiastic involvement with my teaching philosophy. Moreover, they have also shown me with their insightful commentaries and readings of this text, that it is possible to set up a very fruitful transcultural dialogue and exchange of ideas with literary works that were written in different cultural, chronological, and social milieus. More importantly, though, is that the college classroom becomes a space where many of the contemporary human social conflicts can be faced up openly and creatively through dialogue and debate. This is just one of the many possible ways of using literature for transcultural dialogue and conflict resolution.